Hi, I'm Alexander Kobli, also known as CBLGH on the internet and on Scuttlebutt. And I've been working as part of the SSP NGI working group, mostly on the Go side of things. But today, I am a content creator. So in this video, I'll be giving an introduction of Netsum, what it is, why it is, and how to use it. And in the second half of the video, we'll see some Netsim generated benchmarks of the various Scuttlebutt implementations that have been improved during the year of NGI. So, what is Netsim? Netsim is a tool written in Go for simulating and testing secure Scuttlebutt implementations with each other. And why it exists is because in the SSB NGI working group, we've been making a lot of changes to try to make SSB faster and enable the use of new feed formats. So, coming back to speed, we didn't really have a great way to test or benchmark performance in an easy or reproducible fashion, and that's without even taking into account the difficulty of testing SSB across programming language barriers, like fairly comparing the performance of an SSB Go peer against a JavaScript peer. So, concretely, one of the goals of NetSim was to create a tool to measure performance before and after the changes we've made over the year of design and development. So let's move on and briefly outline the parts that make up NetSim, uh, and here we have them. We have the simulator, the puppets, language implementations, something I call simshims, uh, test files which are written in a small, easily parsed domain-specific language, simulation output, which is test anything protocol compliant, and fixtures, mock SSB data provided by the tool SSB-fixtures. So let's kind of tie all of these parts together. Um, the simulator reads a test file and configures puppets according to what is written in the test, and a puppet is a NetSim controlled SSB peer. So for example, a puppet Alice might have a hop setting of 2, while a puppet Bob could have a hop setting of 3. The primary purpose of a puppet is to run what I call a language implementation, which is equivalent with an implementation of Secure Scuttlebutt. For SSB implementation to be testable in NetSim, it has to be able to send and respond to a specific set of MUX RPC calls. SSB's set of MUX RPCs, or multiplex remote procedure calls, are the de facto interface that makes Scuttlebutt tick, and it's through these calls that different clients and peers currently communicate with each other. There are, however, various details which must be specified to make a given SSB server actually start to run. Uh, stuff like command line flags determining the, the, the location of the SSB secret or which ports to use. How these settings are defined also varies across implementations. Instead of encoding those details in the test script or hard coding values for different implementations in the simulator, I decided to punt that problem to what I call the simshim. Now, a simshim is a file named exactly sim-shim.sh, which is a bash script, and it lives in the same directory as the language implementation that's going to be test tested. The simshim contains the local knowledge required to start that implementation's SSB server. Uh, so we can see here, uh, we have the example of an SSB server called ssb-server-19, and then the location of the simshim that knows how to start that would be located in its root folder. Uh, and what it would look like in the test script when you start a puppet of this particular implementation would be like this, start alice ssb-server-19. Um, so what NetSim does when you start up a peer of a particular language implementation is that it starts a new process running the sim shim script that's in the specified implementation's root directory. But just starting a puppet that doesn't do anything would be kind of boring, so let's talk a bit about NetSim's test files. Um, so each test is written in a kind of assembly looking language, and the language is comprised of a set of commands that correspond to various SSB MUX RPC calls, puppet settings, or commands for controlling the simulation. So here we have an example of a test script, and this test starts out by defining two puppets, peer and server, and the puppets are each configured with a hop setting of 1. 
and they're both running a language implementation called ssp-server. So server makes two posts and the two puppets are made to mutually follow each other. Directly below the follows we see an assertion being made on peer to verify that it is following the puppet named server. And lastly we make the two puppets connect and then wait until peer has synced all of server's messages. So when the simulation reaches the end of the test file, it then powers down the two puppet processes and outputs statistics on the run. So this is what you'd see uh, when you run the test that we just looked at. So you see these statements and when you run the test file with the NetSims tool, each of these statements will appear on your screen as they're executed. Uh, so these statements or these outputs lines, they're conforming to the test anything protocol, commonly known as TAP, which means you can parse this output using any TAP parser, like for example the Node.js command line tool TAP. Uh, so as we can see in the test here, each non-white space line from the test script produces a passing or failing TAP assertion, as well as some informative com uh, comments from the simulator, depending on the particular command. So you can see that enter or hops, they don't really output anything because what enter is doing is it's just declaring a new peer that's going to be used in the test file and hops is configuring one of the existing peers. But we can see at the start command that peer, when it's being started, it has zero messages in its local database and it's being started uh, with the identity or rather being generated with this identity, ampq, so on. And that it's... Uh, the information from its uh, implementation, SSB server, is being logged to the file peer.txt, so you can look at things after the fact. And um, towards the end here, we see some runtime statistics. Uh, so what we can see then is that the total time it took to execute this test was 5.4 or 5.5 seconds if you want to round up. Uh, but the active time was just short of one second. And what this means is that we have these kind of wait statements in the simulator, like the wait until uh, part, uh, which waits until peer has synced all of server's messages. But we also have some other waits, like in the start commands, uh, because when you start a new implementation, we kind of do a wait there uh, so that the implementation has time to start up before we start querying it. And that's done in a smart way. So the actual time, if you subtract the running time from all, and then uh, take the running time, subtract all the weights, is what you get the active time from. And at the bottom we can see that uh, we have these per puppet statistics as well. And it might be a bit confusing uh, to look at the number of messages columns. But what's happening there is that we see that peer has posted one message in the test script, but it's actually displaying us four messages, which makes sense if you think about it because peer has also synced all of server's messages. Server made three messages, two posts and one follow, plus peer's one follow message equals four. So uh, that's kind of what it looks like when you make a NetSim run on a test. But maybe you don't want to write this kind of assembly language thing directly. Well, you're kind of in luck because there's a module called ssb-netsim that allows you to write these things in a different way. Uh, so we can see here that um, uh, we're start starting up here with the sim.peer command. We have peer.start, peer.waitUntil, and so on. And this might be more convenient for some people. From the perspective of the, of the NetSim tool, it doesn't really matter because this, the output from this command and the output from this, it will basically be give the exact same output when you run it with NetSim. So it's more a matter of taste or how you want to generate things. Um, and of course there are more commands that you can use and there's more stuff to learn about NetSim. So if you want to know more, you can check the links in the description. But let's kind of move on and talk a little bit about how you can use NetSim. And basically, I mean, there are two things. You can create tests or you can run them. 
And as we've seen, you can create tests by writing DSL statements in a file, or by using the companion Node.js library, or by generating a test. So there's this option in NetSim to generate a NetSim test from a set of SSB fixtures. And SSB fixtures is a tool written as part of the NGI SSB work. And what it does is it probabilistically generates a complete SSB database full of different identities, their key pairs, relations between them, and a distribution of host types, and a lot more. So NetSim has the ability to take one of these SSB fixtures generated databases, convert it into something more suitable for NetSim, and then after a few more internal steps, it outputs a generated NetSim test. And now be warned, if you generate a large database with SSB fixtures, then the corresponding automatic NetSim test can take quite a while to execute. But it can be kind of nice to use these automated tests as a kind of smoke testing to make sure that the basics are working for a particular implementation. So this is what it would look like. NetSim has the generate subcommand. So you run NetSim generate on uh, the output you'd get from when you run the ssb fixtures tool. And when you run this without anything else, you get the test dumped to standard out. So if you want to save it somewhere, then you can write the second line where you just redirect it to a file of your choosing. So what you get then is a NetSim test full of NetSim commands. And how you'd run it, or a regular test, is this way with the run subcommand. So we have the uh, NetSim run subcommand, and then we specify the test file we're running. And at the end, we have the SSB implementations. So for example, if you had a test file that has uh, three implementations it's testing against, a JS one, a Go one, and a Rust one, you'd have all of these appended to the end of the invocation. So flags first, and then SSB servers at the end. And if you want to run a test that's testing against these fixtures, you pass the fixtures flag. And then finally, uh, the test and the uh, SSB server. So it might be nice to know that you can interchange the position of the flags, but of course, keep the language implementations at the end. So also, if you need any help with NetSim, run any of the commands with the dash H flag to see a list of possible flags. And if you run into a corner case, then make sure to look at the NetSim readme and glance over the documents in the docs folder of the NetSim repository. So here are some resources. We have the NetSim repo. We have the list of commands and a small description for them in the docs slash commands page. There's also a document that's listing up uh, different caveats when, and gotchas basically when you're testing a Go peer, for example, or when you're testing a JS peer. We also have a repository called NetSim Cookbook, which is a collection of NetSim testing scripts. So if you have a script that you think is just like the best NetSim test ever, or you have something that's very useful or helpful when you want to get started with NetSim, then please make a PR to the NetSim Cookbook repo. In the NetSim repository, there's also a releases page uh, where we currently have a 1.0 release. And this 1.0 release is kind of special because it also has attached a bundle. And this bundle um, contains a Go SBOT peer, a uh, implementation of SSB server for the JavaScript side of things, and a pre-generated SSB fixtures. So basically everything in this bundle called the care package contains what you'd need to get, uh, what you'd need to kind of just get started. Uh, and other than that, there's also binaries for NetSim in, uh, for various Linux distributions. And finally, we have the SSB NetSim uh, module. Uh, so, yes, now it's over to my esteemed colleague Glyph for a presentation on the current benchmarks and how NetSim played a part in creating them. Thank you. Hi, this is Glyph another member of the Secure Scuttlebutt NGI pointer team. I've primarily been working on message validation and meta feeds during these past six months, mostly in Rust, but also with some sneaky JavaScript in the mix. 
And lately I've been using the NetSim tool to produce performance benchmarks for the various Scuttlebutt server implementations. NetSim is useful not only for comparing various Scuttlebutt implementations with one another, but also seeing the effect of code and configuration changes in a single implementation. We can also test performance and identify potential bugs in cross-implementation scenarios. Today I'm going to demonstrate the six-second replication tests, which were designed as a simple means of comparing the JavaScript SSB DB server, the JavaScript SSB DB2 server, and the Go server. These are what are commonly referred to as SBOTs or Scuttlebots. DB2 was written as part of this NGI funded project with the primary goal of improving performance. And so it's nice to be able to test it in comparison with both the original database and the Go implementation. We'll begin by visiting the netsim-cookbook repo so that we can clone it and get to work. Here is the repo. In the readme, you'll find guidelines for submitting your own test scripts. And currently we have two directories, one containing a test which runs a full sync of two peers and the other with a six second replication between two peers. And this is the one we're interested in today. So let's clone that. And once that's downloaded, we will move into the cookbook directory. And we're going to move into the six second directory. So we can see that there are directories for Go, JS, and JS with DB2, along with an installation script and a simulation script. And if we take a peek inside the Go directory, we have the test file itself and a simshim. A similar thing for the JS directory with the addition of a package.json file and a bin.js file. So these help to ensure that the configuration parameters are going to be the same for our tests. Now what we can do, um, right before, well, let's take a peek at this installation script. Take a peek inside. And what I'd like to do, this is using npm to install some things. So I would rather use pnpm. So I'm quickly going to do that. And then let's execute the installation script. So first of all, it's downloading the fixtures. The fixtures contain the data set for our simulation. So it's all the data for 100 peers with 100,000 messages in total. So this essentially is a simulated social graph, which will be input into our simulation. Once that's extracted, we download the care package. So CBLGH mentioned this earlier in the video. This includes our actual SBOT implementations. So it has a directory with the JavaScript server as well as the Go server and some other configuration files. So once that's extracted, we start installing both of the JavaScript servers. First we'll install the one which uses SSB DB and then DB2. And of course NetSim is designed in such a way that it's not touching your local Scuttlebutt installation. So if you're a regular Scuttlebutt user and you're concerned about, you know, potentially forking your feed or messing up your database, that's not a concern here thanks to NetSim. So now that everything's configured, we can see some additional files and directories, um, including our Go SBOT, our SSB server, and our SSB server with DB2. So um, let's run a test, shall we? Let us run a test. It's worth mentioning that you'll need to have the netsim command um, accessible from this directory. So I've placed mine in my user bin directory, um, but you can do what's best for your setup. 
So we're going to call the run command. And let's run the DB2 test. Select our test script. And then we also need to pass in our fixtures. And we lastly need to point to our SSB server directory that actually holds the, the server implementation. And we can run that and we have this beautiful output which is telling us what's going on. So we begin by configuring our peer and we load up a particular public key identity. This is one of the identities that was generated in our fixtures. Then we also configure a server with a, a different identity. And it's worth noting that peer and server here are user-defined names. So this could really be anything uh, you choose. And we'll note that server has the all offsets command passed to it. So essentially what this is saying is give the server puppet all of the messages in the data set. And we see when it starts up, server has 100,000 messages across 100 feeds. So this is acting like a pub in this scenario. And it's uh, an, an omniscient pub. It knows all the messages. And we start our peer, which begins with 10,249 messages in one feed. So it doesn't start from zero because this peer already has been active. It's been generating messages. And so that's the starting figure for this identity. We create a mutual follow to make sure these two nodes are going to replicate once they connect. We wait 10 seconds just to ensure that everything is configured. And then we start a timer. We connect the peer to the server. We wait for six seconds and then we stop the timer. So this is allowing us to see, okay, in a six second window, how many messages are replicated from server to peer. And we, run, we can run that same test against the JavaScript implementation with conventional DB and also the Go implementation. Now we see the report is being generated. We've got the total time that our simulation was running, as well as the active time and our puppet count. In NetSim parlance, a puppet is uh, one peer, essentially. And we have two in this test. And here we see our results. So server has 100,001 messages. It has an additional message because it followed peer. And our peer has 50,535 messages, which is approximately 40,000 more than it started with. And it has a total of 46 feeds. So it replicated 45 feeds during that time in addition to its own feed. Great. So now we also have in this repo a simulate script. All that this is doing is running the test you've just seen in addition to the regular JavaScript test and the Go test one after one another. Just makes testing a little bit easier. If we go back to the repo and take a look in the issues, you'll find the full test results for the simulation. Scroll down to the second comment here. And so here we have a summary. First go, then db2, then js. And we see that in the case of the Go servers, approximately 9,000 messages per second were replicated, 6,500 for db2, 4,300 for js with SSB db. So that's approximately 2x performance for Go and 1.5x over the conventional JSDB implementation. And you'll also find some complete test output here of the various numbers. So it's worth mentioning here that these performance benchmarks should really always be taken with a grain of salt, especially given the complexity of the implementations being tested. But yeah, we're really excited to see how the tool will be put to use. And I'm sure that given some time, we'll find ways to develop more robust and reliable and holistic test suites. If you have any questions about NetSim or NetSim testing, please either reach out to us on Scuttlebutt or open an issue in the NetSim repo or the NetSim cookbook repo. Thanks very much for listening. Take care.